All right. Hello. My name is Jessica Graham, and I am the Civics Teacher Leader Fellow for the Department of Education and also a high school social studies teacher at Waterville Senior High School. And I'm really excited this evening to um, share some information about the work that Maine Students Vote and the League of Women Voters have been doing to help get high school students engaged in the legislative process. Uh, I'm here with some interns from Maine Students Vote and League of Women Voters, and also Allison Gardner, who is the director of Maine Students Vote. Um, I have done work like this uh, in my classroom, and my students found it invaluable and have translated some of that work into longer term projects that they're just finishing up now. And I know they're feeling really excited because they have authentic um, work that they can share with their elected officials now, uh, and they're feeling pretty proud of themselves. So I'm eager to have other folks give this a try in their classroom and get some ideas and some resources and uh, help their students do some, do some authentic work out in the community. All right, so I'll pass it over to you guys. Thanks. Um, I'm going to bring up our slideshow and share my screen with you all so that we can move through the presentation that Alex and Frankie have prepared alongside me tonight. Um, we're really excited to talk with you all about ways that folks can incorporate civic engagement into their classrooms. And one of the programs that Maine Students Vote and the League is really proud of is our Youth Council. And in as part of the Youth Council, both Frankie and Alex have joined a semester long program to teach the to teach and explore civic leadership skills so that they can become experts for their community on this work. So I'm Allison Gardner. I use the she, her pronouns, and I am the director of Maine Students Vote. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Wu. I am a sophomore at Scarborough High School, and I use any pronouns. I'm Frankie Roberts. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a senior at Mount View High School. So civic engagement. Uh, how can I educate myself and others through interacting with our democracy? Uh, an important thing to note before we begin, civic engagement can be uh, a lot of different things. In this specific case, we are going to be talking about legislative civic engagement, which is just civic engagement, which is related to like the legislature. So bills and resolution and like politician, that sort of thing. Uh, it's just any action taken addressing issues of public concern within the legislature. So some things you can do to engage is talking to your legislators, writing testimony, and even just educating yourself and others and being informed about various topics is a great way of civically engaging because the, the more informed you are, the better your opinions can be and the more you can contribute to our democracy. Um, so civic engagement can be on behalf of an individual, a community, an organization, or the government. In the case of the League of Women Voters in uh, Maine Students Vote, we are an interest group or an organization. So our civic engagement is on behalf of an organization, um, but you all might be engaging individually. So civic engagement is what drives change within a democracy. So the more you engage, the more change you can create. That's why it's so important to uh, civically engage within our legislature, because our democracy is built for the people and we are allowed to interact with it to have our voices heard. Um, something we're going to talk a little bit later into this workshop is uh, how you can affect how certain bills are received in committee. Um, and that's uh, another way you can affect the legislative process before it actually comes to a floor vote. Um, Frankie and Allison, would you guys like to talk a little bit about uh, what civic engagement means to you guys? I'll go first. Uh, civic engagement to me is making a change because <clears throat> our democracy is by the people for the people. And to really make your voices heard to make a change, uh, you have to civically engage, whether it's through like the the 
list says, uh, talking to legislators, writing testimony, or educating yourself and others. Um, doing small things like this uh, make a huge impact in really creating a change in your local government, school board, state government, federal government, the whole thing. So it's pretty important and it's a very good thing to do. One of my favorite parts about this type of civic engagement is that it's cross-curricular. It doesn't matter if your young person is a really passionate writer or if they're very into science and environmental studies or if they're really into history. Because our legislative session is a citizen-led legislature and our session is so long, there's over 2,000 bills that have been proposed. So there's a bill that will highlight anyone's interests. And one of the key components of the work that we do is that we're a nonpartisan nonprofit. So we'll never back a certain political party and we'll work on issues based on what our membership or what the youth council decides to work on. And civic engagement, while it can look like anything from volunteering in your community to getting out and being involved and making an impact, we're really excited tonight to talk to you a bit more about what writing testimony and this type of civic engagement can look like. Uh, so first of all, what is testimony? Uh, testimony is just formal or written speech that basically just tells legislators of public opinion on a certain topic or bill. So um, because we have such a uh, citizen-led legislature, it's much more accessible to the public um, to be able to write testimony, to be able to speak to our legislators, uh, like Allison was talking about, especially in Maine, because we have such a small legislature and uh, our legislators don't gain much power by being legislators in Maine. Um, they are very accessible people and you can reach out to them and uh, stake your claim in the legislation just by informing them of your voice. Uh, testimony is how members of interest groups or we as the public are able to further our goals within the legislature without being directly involved in the legislative process. And what I mean by uh, direct involvement is sort of uh, either voting directly on a sort of policy or um, budget planning or any sort of voting um, from the public of that sort or of course being a legislator yourself and being able to write up these bills and do that sort of thing. Um, so in between that, um, we get to tell legislators how we feel about certain things and certain topics. And although we aren't directly sponsoring or writing these bills or resolutions or voting on them, we can still affect the decisions that our legislators make because they are meant to represent us. Frankie, would you like to talk a little bit about the experience you've had of writing testimony and what that's looked like and kind of how that's gone for you this year? Uh, yeah, so, so far I've written two um, pieces of testimony and submitted them. Um, the first one, I myself am non-binary, so both of the bills that I wrote testimony on pertained to trans youth in Maine. And so the first one I wrote testimony for was in opposition to a bill that would require parental permission for students to be referred to as a different name and or pronouns in school. So I wrote uh, like personal experience to really like sort of weave that personal connection into the testimony so it had more impact. And I listed, you know, some statistics to back it up with evidence and I submitted it. And then the second piece of testimony I wrote was in favor of a bill that safeguards gender affirming healthcare in Maine. And so again, I put some personal uh, connections into it and I added more statistics to back it up. And it's very important to write testimony and that I submitted these testimonies because just today I was looking over the other testimonies that were submitted that you can read. And a lot of them were not very kind. They were very blunt and harsh and definitely spoke their minds. Um, so it's very important to make your voice heard because 
you never know. You might think, oh, th this is kind of a, a clear, clear issue. People are all going to kind of be on the same page with this, but then you'll see other people doing testimony or submitting testimony and it's the complete opposite. So it's very important to get your your voice out there. And if I'm being honest, I think writing testimony is fun. So. <laughs> Uh, so how does this sort of civic engagement work in Maine? Uh, so first of all, uh, basically just the process of uh, making a bill. First of all, a legislator submits a bill as a sponsor. Uh, I've tossed around this term a little bit before. A sponsor is basically just the author of a bill or its first supporter. Um, so sponsors are the first speaker um, in affirmation of a certain bill or resolution. Um, and they're basically just sort of doing that thing where they actually write in and bring it to a committee. So that's the next uh, process in the bill printing process. You send it to a bipartisan committee that deals with the bill subjects. Uh, bipartisan just means that it has um, legislators of both political parties. And this is basically just to ensure that the committee is informed about the topic at hand and uh, dealing with the sort of topics the bill covers without um, having as much political bias towards a certain political party. Um, one thing they have to sort of do this is they have one representative and one senator, uh, one each from each party uh, as a chair of the committee. And this is basically, again, to prevent uh, political agendas from getting in the way of making the bill better and just a better bill as a whole. So after the bill is sent to the committee, a public hearing is scheduled. And this is uh, where you can actually deliver testimony. So at the public hearing, you can deliver testimony in person over Zoom or in writing. Uh, it is important to note for the in-person or, in or over Zoom, uh, delivering testimony, it does has to or it does have to be on the same date as the public hearing. But if you're writing testimony like uh, Frankie has done, you don't actually have to deliver it uh, or send it in at the exact time when the public hearing is held. So if maybe you have more time constraints, then written testimony is definitely the way to go. Or if a public hearing has already been passed, you can still send in written testimony. Uh, and then legislators can still read that and still have your opinion heard on that. It just might not have as much of an impact as it would if you did it at the public hearing or prior to the public hearing. So after the public hearing is held, a work session is scheduled and the committee works on the bill and decides whether or not to recommend it being passed, being amended and then passed, or to not be uh, passed at all. This is also known within the legislature as ought to pass ought to pass as amended or ought not to pass, um, then the bill may be voted on the floor. Uh, this step is also starred because although you cannot write testimony, you can still contact your, legisl uh, your legislators and encourage them to vote or talk about or to have a certain stance on a certain issue. Um, uh, I know something Frankie did was email one of their legislators to be able to uh, talk about a certain topic and um, after the public hearing, sh you should sort of shift your priorities away from writing testimony to maybe directly contacting your legislators. Uh, because as the work session is held, um, these people are like your neighbors. You can send them an email, you can say hello, send them a quick call or something like that. And then they'll be happy to oblige you. Um, and that way you'll still be able to have your voice heard, but you won't uh, be writing testimony. Uh, so yeah, uh, Frankie, would you like to talk a little bit about how to and uh, what to do when writing testimony? Of course. And to sort of piggyback off of how you mentioned that I've contacted my local representative, it's very easy to do. I was fortunate enough to meet my local representative, Benjamin Himes, twice because I've been to the state capitol to do some lobbying. And uh, it's very easy to reach out to him. You can find your representative's email um you just have to like type it into the google bar like main house of reps and then your town and it'll show up with your person and their email on how to contact them and you just shoot them an email asking um i personally asked for their support on a certain bill that the league and myself supports and 
I urged him to support the bill because the hearing was coming up and he got back to me and told me more about it, which was pretty cool. So testimony. Um, you begin with, or can we pull up the testimony template? Of course. Yeah. All right, so first you write who it's to, which would be the chairs of, um, somebody give me the word here, the committees. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Yes. So the chairs of the committees and you'll know what committee your bill falls under when we go over how to actually find your bill in a couple of minutes. So um, you write the chairs of the committees, the date of the public hearing, not the date that you're writing the testimony, and then what the bill title is. And so you'd open it with a polite good morning, and then you would say, my name is blank, I'm a resident of blank. In our case, since we're representing an organization, we would state that we're a member of the organization, what the organization is, how the testimony doesn't represent the organization's view as a whole, but only the view of the Youth Council. Um, and then you would say what you are testifying, whether in opposition or in support, and then you would write the bill number. So not the bill title, the bill number. Um, and then you put two to three paragraphs of why you want this bill to be supported or opposed. And like I said earlier, it's good to incorporate some sort of uh, personal anecdotes, um, because I imagine when you write testimony for a bill, you're writing it for a bill that means a lot to you. Um, so it's good to incorporate why the bill means something to you, how you're personally connected with it, and back it up with evidence, if you can find evidence support to support it. So it's always good to do that. And so two to three paragraphs about that, and then you close it out with a polite Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you are comfortable answering any questions. And then you just end it there and you send it out. Uh, if I could just uh, add a little bit to what Frankie said, um, this is a lot more uncommon because as Frankie said, uh, usually if you're writing for a bill, you are uh, either, or you're very passionate about it. And usually that means you're either a strong opponent or a proponent of a certain bill, but something that you can do, and this is something that uh, the league has done before, is that you can also say you uh, are neither for or against a certain bill. In that way, if you're writing testimony or if you're just even talking to your legislator, um, that way you're providing your opinion on the bill and like certain aspects of it maybe, but you aren't necessarily giving a stance on the topic. Uh, and then also uh, make sure to always be polite when delivering your testimony. Uh, generally speaking, it's not a good idea to be rude to people you're trying to convince things of. Uh, and also it is still a formal space. It is still the legislature. So uh, try to keep a little bit of that formality, even if we are a little bit more of an informal legislature because it's still Maine. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think, just one last thing, um, if you are not directly affected by the legislation, um, try to keep like, uh, or take an ally stance. And what I mean by that is um, don't try to commodify those that are affected by the bill. Uh, don't try to commodify their experience as your own. Uh, it's okay to like uh, tell how it might affect your friend and how it, you really care about them, but don't try to own their experience because it is not yours. Uh, so just, Keep it factual, and, but a little bit shorter because you might not be directly affected by the bill. And one of the things um, that I've seen through looking at testimony is that while we have a template for kind of like what is the best practices, your testimony can be short as short as a paragraph. And I've seen them as long as 50 page reports <laughs> given to the legislature. So writing testimony is a very accessible way to make sure that your opinion is heard. Our legislature has wonderful analysts and clerks that can provide representatives and senators with how that bill is going to impact the law. But those folks don't provide information of how that bill is going to impact individuals. And so writing testimony is really the tool that our representatives and senators have for knowing how something is going to impact their citizens 
and constituents. So we've talked a lot about how to write testimony, but how do you find the bills that you're gonna write testimony on? So Maine Legislature's website, we're gonna spend some time exploring it. When you first get onto the website, it looks like this. And this is a useful search bar if you know the exact bill number that you're looking for, or if you know the exact text of the title. But it can be a little bit of an unforgiving <laughs> search bar if you don't know those things. So we recommend using the bill text search, which is down here. And it's important that you put in the 131st legislature. This website is lovely because it has all of the historic legislation as well if you're doing your research project. But right now we're in the 131st legislative session. And then I like to use the text or the title search. Um, either are a little bit more broad in this scenario. So if I clicked in the text search, you can see some of the things that we've searched for in the past. Our youth council's advocacy team has worked a bit on school safety and gun safety coal um, legislation. But Frankie was talking about a bill earlier that was on pronouns. So I'm gonna stick pronouns in the text search here and that bill pops up for us. This is where you're gonna to start to get a lot of information. If you click on the bill and fiscal information uh, first, it'll take you to the whole website. Rather, if you just click on the printed PDF, that'll take you straight to the bill. So we recommend first going to the bill's individual website. And then you see the printed PDF is still here for us to look at. So when you're reading the text of a bill, um, the LD number is this number in the top corner here, and that's the legislative document number. It's basically the number the legislature uses to track a bill. Because as you can see, titles sometimes get pretty lengthy. So the bill number ends up being the shorthand. Then you get the committee it was referred to, and you get the representative who or senator who sponsored it and all of the co-sponsors. So this can be great information if your legislature is one of the sponsors or co-sponsors for you to be able to have a more direct conversation with them. And when you scroll down to the text, if it's underlined, then it's text that's being added to the law. If it's struck through, then it's text that's being taken out of the law. And if it is neither, then it is text that already exists in law. With the exception of this summary paragraph here, the summary paragraph is summarizing the bill. Going back to the bill's individual website, if you go, these tabs over here are full of great information. Status in committee is where it will first say which committee it's been reported to. So you see this committee says judiciary and that last one said education and cultural affairs. So when that bill was first printed, they thought it was gonna to go to education and cultural affairs, but then they realized that really it pertains more to what the judiciary committee worked on. So this website will be updated with the committee information that's most relevant. So if you're looking for the committee, head to the individual bill, bill's website and go to status and committee. Here we can see which committee it was in. We can see when its public hearing was, what time, where the location was. And this is great information if you're going to head to Augusta to present your testimony in person. And then since all testimony is public record, you can see the list of people who've submitted testimony and you can read examples of their testimony. You can see Frankie's testimony lives right here. And then it lists the organization or the town that folks are from. The next important piece is when the work session is. The time frame for this bill was today. Today was its work session. So folks had from when the bill was printed, which was back in March, to today to turn in public testimony. And all of that testimony is then put together in a packet and given to the senators and representatives on the committee to be able to have that, how does this bill impact our constituent knowledge? The other important piece of information here is on this left-hand side column. If you go to public or committee schedule and information, 
you can head directly to the committee's website. And this page always takes a little bit longer to load. Um, but once it does load, we're going to see a drop down menu of all of the committees. So when you head over here, make sure you remember which committee you are looking for information on. I always tell folks when we're working with what we call the blue websites, because all of them seem to have a shade of blue in the background, that if it doesn't work for you in the moment, then you should hit reload. And sometimes because of the red legislative sessions, the websites are kind of inundated by folks working on them and they'll take quite a while to come up. But once we get here um, and go to the individual committee's web page. Um, we're going to scroll all the way to the bottom and we're going to see the list of names of who's on the committee. Again, a great moment to know if your legislator is on that list. But the really important information and the really great people, so this is their schedule, um, and you can watch the live stream of what's happening in the committee right from this website. And it just takes you to a Zoom where it's a Zoom webinar. So like you don't pop up on their screen, but you can see what's happening. So today you could see that they had a public hearing on two bills and then work sessions. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom, these are the folks, the committee clerks and the analysts who if you click the plus button, you can get their information. And these folks do the compiling for the committee. And so they are wonderful people to reach out to if you have questions or if you don't understand a certain text in a bill or if you need an update or specific research resource. Um, Frankie, would you like to talk about what we've done to compile bills for the youth council? Yes, so we have this lovely spreadsheet that we use. So on the first column, it's the uh, the legislative document numbers or the bill numbers um, and you know what they pertain to. We have different highlighted sections for different topics. We have like school safety, K through 12, K through 12 education, school security, Wabanaki rights, election participation, gun related, abortion, trans and queer rights, other topics, on and on and on and on. So that is discerning what exactly the bill is or what like genre it falls under. The second column is the actual number of the bill and most of the time the link to the text. So you can read the bill text just by clicking on it. And then the third column is the title of the bill, which usually um, gives you some insight on what the bill is about, but sometimes the titles can be really vague, so it's important to have the second column where you can click the link and see the bill. Like um, in column 10, uh, it's a pretty direct title because it's a big, long title resolved directing the Department of Education, yada, yada, yada. But then column 13 is just an act regarding safe schools, and who knows what that could be about. So it's important to have the link to actually read the text of the bill. And then the next column is who is sponsoring that bill. And then column after that is the committee of the bill, which is important for when you write testimony. So you need to uh, write it to the chairs of the committees of the bill. And then the next column is what day the public hearing is. Um, point person was just who on the youth advocacy team was uh, tracking the bill. So you don't need to know that. And then the last column is if there's already been a hearing, it's, oh no, sorry, the last column is the testimony example of that you can click on so you can see what a structured testimony kind of looks like and what I've already gone through. So yes, this is a very helpful spreadsheet that is being, with more being added to it very often. We also add in the top here, our template that Frankie walked you through earlier for writing testimony. And then there's another um, youth led organization called Maine Youth Action that's developed a really awesome legislative advocacy guide that lives here. And then there's a topic specific guide that was sent to us by the folks who were organizing for the Pine Tree Amendment. And so you can see what they suggested as topical points to write about for a specific bill. 
Alex, is there anything you'd like to add about tracking bills? Uh, I think that was basically it. Yeah, no. Um, uh, other than that, uh, I don't, I think I forgot to mention this earlier. Um, some bills can die in committee, but uh, again, testimony can encourage legislators to further the goals of a certain bill and increase the chance that a bill goes further into the leg legislative process. So um, that would have been something that I talked about uh, when we actually went over the work session process. But again, um, as Allison said, they compile all the testimony and then they go over it, um, I think, during or before a little bit, the work session. Um, so after the work session is, again, uh, they wouldn't er, directly be reading your testimony. So that's when you would shift gear. So kind of, again, that idea, uh, like Frankie did, write testimony before the work session and then talk to your legislators directly afterwards. Um, and I think that's basically it. Frankie, would you like to talk about how you submit testimony once you've written it? Yes. So follow the link. Just go to the main state legislature website and it'll show you this page and you scroll all the way down to publications and resources. And at the very bottom right hand corner is testimony submission, which you click. And then you would click public hearing because that's what you are submitting testimony for. And you will scroll down and choose the committee and it will say on your bill what committee um, the bill is being put through. Uh, and then you choose a date and it'll again say on the bill what date the public hearing is. So you'd click the proper date and you'd scroll down and you'd choose what bill is being discussed because there's more than one bills being having a hearing um, on different days. And so you'd click the right one and then you'd scroll down and you can either write your testimony on a separate Google Doc and then hit choose file and upload the file or you can just copy and paste your testimony in the box down below. And then you write your first and last name, your city slash town of re residence or an organization you represent, your email address, confirm your email address, your phone number, make sure you're not a robot, and then you can submit. And if the public hearing date hasn't already passed, there's a little checkbox here where you can click to testify over Zoom. Zoom testifying is sometimes more accessible, but because the legislative session gets so busy, it can be a long wait <laughs> to be able to know if you're gonna testify over Zoom. Um, and so sometimes it'll say the public hearing starts at one, but say the house session has gone over because they were voting on bills and it actually doesn't start till 2.45. And so you can be on that Zoom for a very long time <laughs> waiting for it to start. And sometimes the clerk will come on and say, hi, we're a bit delayed and we'll give you updates. Um, but just know if you're gonna testify in Zoom or if you're going in person, you need to allow yourself quite a bit of time to be there. What else would you like to add about testifying in person or over Zoom, Alex? Uh, so there are a couple ways of finding where you actually get to deliver testimony when you're actually delivering it vocally. Um, so again, we're going to go back to this website a lot, but if you go back to Maine legislature, um, and I think this was brought up earlier, we can just go to any bill. It's kind of arbitrary. It doesn't matter in this specific um, time, but um, if you go to uh, committee info, I believe, uh, sorry, status and committee. If you go to status and committee, if you're delivering over Zoom, uh, like uh, Allison talked before, when you have the written testimony submission, that's where you'd actually get the Zoom link. And that's why it's so important to put your real email, because um, the way it works is they send over the Zoom link for the public hearing to your email. That way you can actually join and deliver your testimony. So uh, it's they're not just collecting your email for no reason. If you're doing it over Zoom, please put your real email, especially because uh, if you don't, uh, you will not get the Zoom link and then you will not be able to deliver your testimony electronically. Um, but if you're doing it in person, then, and you're going up to the state house in, uh, in Augusta, then this will just tell you the room number where it is. Um, I'm sure that if you're a little bit lost, then 
uh, there are definitely people around that are friendly enough to help you find your way around and just guide you to the room number. So again, you just find the committee that's working on the bill that you selected to write testimony on. And then for Zoom, you just check the box. Uh, like we said before, check the box that you would like to deliver testimony over Zoom, and then you'll receive the Zoom meeting link over your email, assuming you put your actual email. Um, <laughs> and then when the public hearing starts on the, com uh, the committee can change the order of testimony. So make sure that you save at least a couple of hours, um, maybe even a, uh, a whole work-ish day around the range of when the public hearing for your bill is scheduled because the um, the work session and the public hearings, um, all the scheduling can sort of change um, alongside the needs of the committee and what they deem most important. Um, so just make sure that you save a sort of uh, time range around that, just to make sure that you could still deliver testimony. Um, it is unfortunately a bit of a restriction on who can deliver testimony because some people uh, have to work during certain times, but uh, it's just something you have to plan for. Uh, it also is not something that uh, is exclusive to Zoom. Uh, so although Zoom is more accessible because you don't have to travel up to Augusta if maybe you're living a little bit far away from there, um, that is also something you have to worry about if you do go to the state house in Augusta for delivering testimony in person. So just keep in mind, you might be waiting around a little bit to actually be able to deliver testimony for the bill you want if you're going in person. So uh, if you're on a time constraint, I recommend maybe not uh, delivering in person at the state house, especially if you have travel restrictions or time constraints as such. But again, for if you're delivering in person, uh, if you go back to the status and committee page, uh, it will tell you the room number again. So just for the, uh, the judiciary uh, committee on this specific public hearing date, they will be on the uh, or in the room uh, 438 and at 1 p.m. But again, it's a general time range. So keep in mind, you want to keep uh, a good amount of time around that. Uh, for both Zoom and uh, in person, you'll have three minutes to deliver your testimony and you'll be standing, uh, at least for in person, you'll be standing in front of the committee with the public audience behind you. So as you're delivering testimony, you'll have the legislators in front of you, they'll be like your audience, and then uh, you'll be sitting in the audience when you're listening to others deliver testimony on other bills or on this bill, but uh, in a different order, um, and they'll be behind you and you'll just get up with your testimony uh, when you're actually delivering it. Uh, make sure to make 20 copies. This is not an arbitrary number. Um, this is like you literally have to make 20 copies of your testimony uh, and you need to hand them out to the committee clerk so that each committee member can receive a copy of your testimony as well as each committee analyst. Um, as we said with written testimony, all of this sort of stuff is read through and um, heard. So just make sure that they're able to have your uh, testimony um, and that you have enough testimony so that each of them has testimony for them to read or even to um, put in public record after the actual public hearing. That's something the clerk does. They just scan a copy of it into the public record. So if you did not submit written testimony like Frankie did, um, then uh, they would scan that in and they would still have that on public record, even though you delivered it vocally. It's also um, good to note that when you're delivering testimony in person or over Zoom, the senators and representative have an opportunity to ask you questions normally, unless you're there on behalf of an organization or you explicitly state that you're an expert on a certain topic, they won't ask you too many hard questions. And if it's been a long day and they're getting started late, then sometimes they don't ask many questions in general, but there is the opportunity for senators and representatives to ask questions. Uh, uh, I will say another benefit of written testimony is that as Allison said, you can have it any length. So um, I find that for around three minutes, um, around a page-ish, um, probably a little bit less of 12, um, 12 point Times New Roman about fills that uh, time slot for my certain speaking um, tempo. But 
uh, you definitely want to time yourself and make sure you don't go over that time um, and just sort of figure out what sort of spacing works for you and how much you need to write to be able to fill up that three minutes. And again, you don't need to fill up the whole three minutes. It's okay if it's short, but if you're taking the time out of your schedule to do this, generally speaking, you want to optimize the amount of time you're going to be speaking for. Uh, written testimony is something that, again, uh, very short or very long. It can be anything in between as well. That's um, something you can do, but generally try to keep up the three minutes because it is so time consuming to verbally um, deliver testimony. So, yeah. So that's what we have for you today as some background information on how the legislative process works and how you can get involved. And I have worked with classrooms like Jessica's classroom to do a testimony writing workshop where we spend most of the time kind of in the spreadsheet looking at different bills and then students pick a bill and use the template to write testimony like Frankie has done. Um, and that spreadsheet has everything from topic specific to school specific, like there's a bill this session to provide a later start time for high schools. I think that one was particularly <laughs> popular that day. And I've also worked with um, classrooms or clubs um, to go to the state house and have that experience of being there in person and giving testimony. So are there, Jessica, do you have any questions for Alex, Frankie, or I? Um, I don't have any questions. Uh, I thank you so much, Alex and Frankie. That was amazing. I do just want to add um, for folks who might be following this um, later on, I, as an educator, have found this process of learning how to track bills and then how do you how to write testimony and then how to submit testimony. I have found it to be a really powerful exercise for students because it is open to anyone. So there is always a topic, regardless of what a student's passions are or what um, a student's political beliefs are. Uh, this is an exercise that is really open to anyone in the classroom. I don't ever lead my students towards a particular topic. They're really um, as they should, as citizens of the state, they're able to look at what's happening in the legislature. And all I'm sharing with them is this process that really empowers them to um, use their voice in a really effective way. So I found it to be, uh, especially this year after Allison's visit, that was really a wonderful jumpstart to our fourth quarter project. I found it to be um, something that my students really latched onto, regardless of their political beliefs, regardless of what they're excited about. Um, it's been wonderful for everyone. So I really encourage folks to give it a try. And again, as Allison mentioned earlier, a great interdisciplinary project. If you are a science classroom tracking, um, you know, bills about PFAS and water this year would be a really great project. Uh, lots of ways to get your kids thinking about civic engagement, regardless of what type of classroom you're in and regardless of who your kids are, everybody can do this um, super accessible activity once you once you learn the process. It's really open to everyone. So um, I think you guys have done a fantastic job and I'm really uh, eager to see where you go from here. I hope that I hope that this is the beginning of lots of civic activities for both of you guys moving forward. Yeah. And one thing I'll just say before, because it sounds like we're wrapping up, uh, because this is a recording, if anybody has any questions, feel free to send any of us a message about this sort of process on how you could sort of integrate that into your curriculum or how like this sort of process works more in depth. And um, if you want access to those resources, feel free to reach out to Allison um, or to leave a comment down below and just, we'll try to respond to stuff when we can. Uh, again, we're very accessible, um, like the legislature, feel free to <laughs> ask us any questions whatsoever and we would be happy to oblige you. So wonderful. Big shout out to Alex for making the presentation. <laughs> it's so, it was wonderfully done. And also I do wanna have a little plug. I know Allison has a, 
a great civics learning newsletter that uh, comes out monthly. I've been posting it in our weekly uh, civic learning newsletter that goes out to educators. So um, I will continue to plug that in my information and we'll get a link to that on our civic learning website that we'll be making uh, soon. So yeah, so wonderful, wonderful resources. Thank you so, so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.